Okay. So there's a couple of books. Because I had to come here by train, <laughs> rather than, because to get here for nine o'clock in the morning from Bedford to Penge would be difficult if it was by car, I probably still wouldn't have arrived. <laughs> but, <laughs> so I couldn't bring as many as I usually would. But uh, there's a few of these around for the first come, first served. Uh, demolishing strongholds, um, effective strategies for spiritual warfare. Um, and it's 9.50 on Amazon, seven quid if you buy it here. Um, and then there's another one which is the leader's guide to setting people free and that's three quid. Um, also this, this one uh, and the, it's actually a course and there's a student's manual and, a, and you can also download it because it's now out of print, you can download it free from, your, from uh, my website. Um, or you can, um, if you would like it in the hard copy, uh, I wonder, could you leave a list and people can just, if there aren't any left, and just put your name and your church and we'll just send it to churches. Okay. Because we've got plenty of them left. Okay. I was asked to do deliverance and healing at this session, at, at this uh, conference, so I'm going to do something on physical healing now. Um, I'm, and uh, tomorrow we'll look at practical deliverance and how it works out today, particularly actually in the culture of our times where one has to have, take care over some things that we would have been more relaxed about 20 years ago. So um, I'm going to talk on physical healing in this particular session and then we've got a Q&A which doesn't relate to physical healing, relates to everything I've taught and then we'll have a prayer ministry time. Okay, so physical healing. So, oh, let's pray. <laughs> Father, just thank you for the fact that you're God who heals today. Lord, thank you. There's much about this we don't understand. Lord, because you are God and we are who we are, your creatures. But Lord, help us to grow in increasing faith for you to heal today. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Just a few things by way of introduction. We believe God is a God who heals, believe he still heals, but it's important we don't find ourselves in bondage to a number of things when we come to this subject of healing. Firstly, any particular method of healing. Again, people put that forward. Um, now, what often happens is those that have a extensive healing ministry, find themselves in faith for certain things, for things to operate in a particular way. Okay? And so they build on that, and then that becomes a method that others try and copy without the faith and anointing of the person who uh, exercises it as his gift in that particular way. And so please don't be in bondage to any particular way of doing things, which sadly is um, the case very often within the charismatic movement, because you don't copy methods without operating in the same faith or anointing. Also, respect anointing whilst not always gr agreeing with theology. <laughs> okay, because some, some of the theology behind healing ministry that's taught I may not agree with, but I still respect the fact that the faith of those and anointing of those uh, ministers 
is something of God. And so uh, we need to respect that. Secondly, don't be in bondage to whether he healing is instantaneous or a process over time. Um, this has been quite an issue in the history of the charismatic movement. I remember, I remember years ago, forgive me, old, old guy again, forgive me, I remember years ago people saying things like, well, if you've prayed in faith, then don't pray again. Okay, no, no, just keep praying. Now, we're living, as I'll explain later, in a time when we're in growing faith, when the kingdom is continuing to break in. Therefore, um, don't sort of get into that sort of um, bondage either. Or, uh, again, very, very unhelpfully, people would say, uh, once we have prayed, we simply stand on the confession of our healing. Okay, I'm, again, I'm addressing things within the charismatic renewal. If you come from a different background, that may not be an issue for you. Other things may be. But the, 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 please know healing can be a process. We can pray several times. And sometimes uh, on certain things, we need to get to the root of a particular sickness in order to see the person healed and stay healed. I've seen things where people have had an emotional issue, which has led to a physical effect. And sometimes you see what seems to be a healing and then people, open quotes, lose their healing when actually it's certain emotional issues that have not been dealt with. Okay. So, on the other hand, if you stress too much the process, then sometimes you can reduce faith for actually believing God to work instantly and so um, I, I just want to just try and um, try and help us not be in a box on this sort of thing and so also the western world view that I was talking about earlier can also r reduce our faith for God to move in healing power Sometimes I, I'm surprised how many people get healed in, in, in context in other parts of the world, whereas there seems to be, need to be breakthrough on the same things in our own culture. Having said that, it's so much a mystery, and yet I'm trying to grow in it all the time. You know, I've often heard of people being healed over things when I've been preaching or uh, and I'm absolutely amazed because I, I never thought that that was happening other times I've really prayed for things and somehow they don't get healed okay I'll deal with the theology of that a little bit later I was I was preaching in a church a couple of years ago um, and one of the pastors of that church came up to me afterwards and said uh, do you know, at the Stonely Bible Week many years ago, I was an unbeliever. I was brought by friends into a meeting. I walked in, and as I walked in, you said, I don't remember any of this, <laughs> you said, there's somebody now being healed from colitis. I don't remember saying that. He said, that was my problem. I had ulcerative colitis. Instantly I felt something in my body and I gave my life to Christ at the end of that meeting and now I'm a pastor of a church. <laughs> and I, I no memory. I don't remember really going for this. It was just a word of knowledge about something that was happening. And nearly 20 years later, I find out about it. You know, it's just, and there's a, there's a mystery about it, but we must keep going for it, because that mystery, as we, as, 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 as we accept this mystery, but also step forward in faith, amazing things start to happen. 
So for that reason, we need to be meditating regularly upon God's word concerning healing and continue to pray and step out in faith based on God's word. And the two key scriptures that I like to keep meditating on in this respect is not only the stories of Jesus' healing or the stories of the apostles' healing, but actually the more uh, one theological and one more practical statement that comes in the Bible. So firstly, what Jesus said in John 14, I tell you the truth, anyone who has a faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now, it's a scripture that at the same time I love to meditate upon and I find very difficult. Okay, so what are the greater things? I mean, I would be content with doing the things that Jesus did. Okay, what does he mean, the greater things? And I'm not sure I've fully resolved it, but I feel now, because he's gone to the Father, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church worldwide, who are seeing worldwide, so it's greater in extent. It's not that it's greater than raising the dead or greater than uh, sight to the blind, but it is greater in extent that now, like Jesus said, it's profitable that I go away. If I didn't go away, the Holy Spirit wouldn't come. Now the presence of Jesus by his Spirit can be enjoyed by his people all over the world, and therefore healing uh, can result from that. And so I meditate upon that. I think about it. Okay, Lord, that's what you said. Okay, I'm not seeing as much as I would like, but I am seeing something. And I trust God. And don't back off. And don't back off because of disappointment, because that's what the Word of God says. Okay. Um, And then the second scripture that I like to meditate upon this is this. James 5, very, very simple. Um, I, love, I, I, I teach a lot now from the book of James, um, which in sort of the reform background I came from is not so prominent because Martin Luther said some unhelpful things. And, uh, and, and, um, but the book of, because the center of Christianity is moving from the west and has moved to the south and the east, one of the things that Jenkins says in his book on the new Christendom is what he's noticed in the south and the east, they preach much more from the book of James. And in fact, in a Middle East country that I'm working in, uh, there was one person there who used to go along to Christian meetings, it was a place where people, it wasn't completely closed, went went on to Christian meetings, and his reason for going, because he was a staunch Islamist, his reason was to discourage all the others that were going from coming to faith. And so for a couple of years, he went to Christian meetings for this reason. And one of my friends who was working in that nation said, met him and he'd come to faith. I said, what was it that brought you to faith? He said, I read the book of James. And that sounded as though God was speaking. I thought, I felt that's how God would speak. Because it's like the book of Proverbs in the New Testament, the book of James. It's got loads and loads of easily memorable things. Sorry, I'm going off subject a little bit. But uh, I'm so excited by what God's doing in other parts of the world that I like to bring some of it back. And so I often teach on the book of James because it's like the book of Proverbs in the, in the New Testament the New Testament book of Proverbs, and most of the world, particularly oral cultures, which represent 70% of the world, learn through stories and Proverbs. Therefore, when I preach, I tell stories and Proverbs. And the book of James is full of Proverbs. You can remember, faith without works is? You see, you remember it, okay? You remember all these things. Count it all joy, brethren, when? You face all sorts of trouble. It was just full of these simple things that you can easily remember. Or wonderful pictures like the tongue. You know? But James says this. Is anyone of you in trouble? He should pray. Do we need to know that? But it's really good, isn't it? (laughs) Is anyone happy? 
Well, there are a few of those around. <laughs> Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And each of those are very simple statements. And what James is saying, this is what New Testament church life is like. You know, he was writing to people who'd fled as refugees, fled under the, after the persecution of Stephen, and they'd fled, and their previous pastor was writing to them, to them in their particular situation, and saying, come on, this is normal Christian life. This is what it's like. Okay, so the, the book of James. Interestingly, in the Eastern Bibles, in the from the Orthodox tradition, and I preach a lot in R Russia and places, the book of James is even in a different place to what it is in our Bibles. Did you know that? You know, we sort of go, Gospels, Acts, Paul, and then at the end somewhere, <laughs> James, John, and Peter. The Eastern order, and there's nothing inspired about the order of Scripture, so don't, I'm not building a doctrine. But the, it's, it's, you know, it's been done more chronologically, so James comes after Acts. Ah, it's just a bit of useless information for you. Uh, but somehow, our, the way we, even those sort of things have some consciously can have a bearing on how we teach, you know? So, so that was the expectation of normal church life. If you're happy, sing. If you're sick, seek healing through laying on of hands and anointing with oil. By the way, any sort of oil. Again, in some charismatic circles, you have to get special stuff from the Holy Land. <laughs> no. <laughs> I just throw those things in case anyone's involved in them. <laughs> and... The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he sinned, he'll be forgiven. Okay. So, and again, there's a biblical balance here. Gifts of healing are distributed with, widely within the body of Christ. That's the teaching of Corinthians. So just like you can all prophesy, and um, so God distributes gifts of healing within his church amongst ordinary members. It's not something specially for leaders. On the other hand, there are helpful times when those with spiritual authority in the church will almost commit the resources of the church to you by praying for you. So you get that balance. All can, he all can pray. Gifts of healing may be distributed. And sometimes the elders pray. And in fact, you get both in that scripture, because it says, call for the elders. Then it says, you can pray for each other that you may be healed. Also, healing is to be seen as functioning within an atmosphere of loving care. Okay? We believe that God gives particular ministries of healing, but we're not see, to see healings as taking place only in the large healing meeting. And it's very important sometimes people again within the charismatic movement will go after particular anointed ministries that's because sadly many have an old testament view of anointing rather than a new testament view old testament view of anointing was on special people at special times for special tasks on prophet priest and king new testament i will pour out my spirit on all flesh but nevertheless there are those who God has anointed particularly in this way. As long as we don't think, we must go to someone special. I remember, where was I? In Denmark. And uh, this lady came up to me. She said, will you pray for me? She said, I've already been prayed for by Reinhard Bonker and Paul Yonggi Cho. Now will you try? <laughs> <laughs> But 
But it's important if we go to meetings with those particularly anointed in this area that we go in order not to see it as a show demonstrating somebody else's major gift, but rather look for your own faith to be extended because the Holy Spirit that is upon them is also upon the whole body of Christ and upon you, therefore. Okay. And it's important that the person being ministered to knows that we love them, whatever the immediate prayer outcome. Sadly, sometimes people can almost be just sort of numbers in a prayer, prayer healing line or something like that. No, no, no. It's to be in the atmosphere of the loving care of the body of Christ. And if they're not healed, they know you love them. Again, extremely important. So we minister the love of God. Also, get to know the roots of an illness. Now many, there's just a physical root, there's nothing else, but sometimes there is something else and that's important. Let me give you an illustration before I actually come to speak about this. As I shared this morning, I've sometimes had um, backlash for some of the stuff I've been doing around the world. And I take that seriously. And years ago, our younger daughter was just a, about 18 months old. And our youngest daughter. And I'd been involved in, in our own church in praying for a woman that had been under a voodoo curse. And it was, I mean, it was an awful thing. And uh, her mother, who was controlling, used to go to her, this lady's flat, take things out of the flat, do a voodoo ceremony with them, and then introduce them back in. The ho her home group leader was praying with me and my wife with her. And uh, he came out one morning and their garden was disturbed. And we were meeting that evening to pray. Nobody knew except the lady and us. And so he said, what's happened? Why have all these flowers died? Dug it up and there was a dead headless chicken been put there to try and put now I um, yeah, curse without a cause can't alight so I'm not worried about that but it just shows you what you're dealing with anyway we had one particular evening and this lady was wonderfully set free from it and then um, please I'm not saying this to scare you, but then next, next morning, our daughter, got her, we got her out of the cot, and she couldn't walk. She'd been able to walk, but her knees were all swollen up, and she couldn't walk. This went on for some time. Went to the hospital. She was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, and... Um, we, we were told she may have it for life, or she may, it may be a juvenile form that she grows out of. Well, we set about praying. Obviously, we had a, a group of two or three ladies in our church that prayed every week over her. Sometimes when she was asleep, sometimes when she was awake. They did it in a loving way. It was no, well, within a few weeks, she was completely healed. They couldn't find any rheumatoid factor in her blood. And eventually, she became a professional dancer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, now when, they, when these ladies prayed, obviously they prayed against the backlash of what we'd been involved. They didn't know the details, but because I don't obviously share that, because they would have known the person. But just, I just shared we were being involved in a very tough situation. So they prayed against the lashback of the enemy. Also, 
when Scylla was carrying this child, she went through some stuff where people made accusations against us, which was horrible, and she felt the emotion of that. And so they prayed over the emotions that Scylla was going through when carrying her. Honestly, I'm an Orthodox Evangelical, okay? Don't worry, all this stuff. But this is what happened. Okay. And so what did we have? We had a, a demonic root of attack, not, not a demon on, on my daughter, but attack. We had emotional issues, and we had a physical, medically proved physical condition of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, all came together. And it was important to know those things as they prayed. Now you say, well, God could have just healed anyway. Yes, he could. But it was important that we went through those things. And as I say, you know, this took several, several weeks, perhaps two or three months, completely healed. And that demonstrated now by, I mean, now she got through kids and planting a church with her husband. But <laughs> uh, for a while... You know, I did a dance degree with a professional dancer and demonstrating God's care in this issue. But it shows that sometimes, not in most cases, but sometimes there can be roots to it that we just need help to pray about. Sometimes even of sin, Jesus refers to that by implication in John 5.14 where he says go and sin no more that nothing worse might happen to you. Do you remember that? It doesn't mean all sickness is a direct result of sin by the person concerned or even by their family. Jesus makes that clear as well in John 9. And of course all in general terms all sickness is the result of sin having come into the world through the fall of man. So we must never, never, never condemn people by blaming any sickness onto sin in their lives. On the other hand James says, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. Do you think that means something? So I never put that on someone, but sometimes there can be bitterness, which can have an effect on people. There can be anger that can have an effect on people. Confessing sins to one another was part of the healing process. Sickness may be rooted in emotional difficulties, such as fear, insecurity, perfectionism, tension, stresses, rejection. Again, as I mentioned, I just got back last weekend from Russia, and uh, I did a, we had a time, I'd been ministering there, and I didn't lead this at all. One of the local guys led it. Well, let's have a time of praying for the sick, and just pray for someone next near you, and that's good, because... In cultures where sort of the one leader has been prominent, it's wonderful now to see all these churches where they have body ministry instead of that. And because uh, culturally that would be foreign to them. But um, one young woman who I knew came, to, came up to me and someone else and just said, she's got stomach ulcers. Would I pray for her? And she was really in pain. And I, I just felt. And so I said to her, do you have major rejection problems? She said, what do you mean? And, and then she said how for various reasons there's well-meaning but unhelpful family jokes about her because she looked unlike the rest of the family. So they would joke about it, just, you know, not seriously. But she just felt she didn't belong and didn't measure up and was a perfectionist who was never good enough. And I said, oh, that's what I want to pray for. And I prayed for that. And she said to me next morning, it's the first time I've gone all night without pain. I saw her over the next few days, no pain, 
no anything. She started to eat all the things she wasn't allowed to eat, no problem. You understand? And, and I said, and she went under these things that were said about her emotionally. And I said to her, that's where you've got to keep clear. Because it's very easy to go under these sort of things. You understand? So there are different issues. I, I just felt, well, it wasn't just I felt God speaking to me. That would be claiming too much. I've had a lot of experience of praying for people. And I've had experience of that before. So I just asked the question. So I'm not going to claim words of knowledge or anything. I just, sometimes I get those. But it's this case with experience, really. And so I just asked the question. Just occasionally, sickness can be demonic in origin. Jesus talked about spirits of infirmity, didn't he? And again, I've sometimes known that, where I've been praying for a whole group of people to be healed. And I've come to one, and suddenly I get a reaction. And I think, ah, oh, this one's a spirit of infirmity. It's a tiny minority amongst all the people I've prayed for in a big group in different cultures. But just need to understand. Then, of course, there's lots of other ordinary things, aren't there? Excessive pressure of work. Okay. I'm not sure I should ever preach on that. <laughs> Those of you who know me. Overtiredness, heredity factors. But then most is simply something physical which we're looking for God to heal in. But how we pray can be determined by our discernment of the root. But please don't get into bondage on that, you know. Or oh, what's the real reason for this? Now, this is a real reason. God will, God will open it up. Often when I'm praying with people, you know, I don't get the word of knowledge, they do. This happens lots of times. Oh, yes, I remember this. And so we pray. Because the Holy Spirit's at work in them as much as in me. You understand when we're praying within the body of Christ. So, that's important in terms of recognizing that sometimes there are different routes. Faith. John Wimber said, faith is the medium through which God releases his healing power. And faith is almost always involved when a healing takes place. But that faith can be operating in different people. Sometimes it's the sick person themselves. It says, Paul saw the crippled man in Lystra and saw that he, in Acts chapter 14, he saw that he had faith to be healed. I wonder what he saw. It wasn't Paul's faith on that occasion. He saw that the person had faith to be healed. And again, I've experienced that, particularly in other cultures. Someone just has a real sense of expectancy that God is going to meet them. Sometimes it's friends or relatives of the sick person. Luke 5 verse 20, Jesus healed a crippled man on seeing the faith of the four men who brought him. Seeing their faith. The bloke on the stretcher didn't seem to have much at all, but their faith was, if we get him here... On the other hand, sometimes relatives or close friends present when praying for healing can be a hindrance because they create an overly emotionally charged atmosphere which is different from faith. And so um, Jesus actually dismissed the crowds on one occasion when he wanted to pray for that Jairus' daughter. Sometimes it's the person praying. It's the prayer of faith that can make the sick person well. Sometimes there can be general faith in a church or in a particular meeting because faith has been imparted by teaching the word of God or by accurate words of knowledge which reveal particular conditions that God is going to heal. Faith is sometimes simply the determination to step out 
And I've had the experience many times in public settings when I just thought, okay, we're going to pray and God's going to do something. Okay, so it's, it's faith is there. Now the prayer time. Now, firstly, public prayer times. I'm just going to share what I do, but please don't use that as a method. Get principles from it. Okay. This is what I usually do sometimes, it's different. Often I will first call people out or forward or to put their hands up or get other people get around them for specific conditions of which I believe God's laid on my heart. Now that is not necessarily words of knowledge. Sometimes it is like the time I related where the guy got healed of colitis. That was a word of knowledge. Someone here is being healed of that. But often, it's because we, we've got to be in integrity over words of knowledge. Because if I said, there's someone here with a back problem, <laughs> in a congregation this size, there'll be someone here with a back problem. Okay, that's not a word of knowledge. But sometimes I feel the Holy Spirit just says, pray for these things as a symbol, if you like, as a first step towards raising faith in that gathering. Do you understand? It's not a word of knowledge. People often quote it as if it is. No, it's not. It's just these are things that God put on my heart, either when I was praying beforehand or in the moment. Okay, so I'll often do that first. Um, and then we'll pray over them and then leave them with others to pray with them. Because I believe in a combination of faith from the person preaching and the body operating and the Holy Spirit working through the body of Christ. So I try and combine both. So I may pray at the beginning, then ask people to uh, carry on praying. Sometimes we'll ask for testimonies if things, if, but often things are things that you can't give a testimony until you've had medical confirmation. So, you know, be careful about that. If it's something where you couldn't move part of your body before and then you can, and when, that, when it is that sort of thing, I often say to people, just start moving and see what happens. Because often they get healed as they move. Sometimes, but if it's a thing that you need testing afterwards, then I don't get testimonies until there have been good uh, medical checks on it. Sometimes you see, dem you see the Holy Spirit come on somebody and some sort of physical manifestation of the Holy Spirit's presence, often not. Please don't get hung up either way. And then um, encourage people to pray for one another or come forward on other things that they want healing for. I believe it's right to follow the example of Jesus and others in the New Testament and speak to the sickness at this particular point. Okay. Not time for long intercession. And, as I say, encourage people to do what they couldn't do before. I've seen frozen shoulders healed simply because people started moving them in an atmosphere of God moving in a meeting and as they do that, the healing comes. Then, in small ministry team situations, because one of the things I also believe in is, yes, you do public prayer, but then people may have conditions where you need ongoing prayer. And please, that's good. And sometimes we have set up small ministry teams, sometimes for emotional healing, sometimes for deliverance, sometimes for physical healing, sometimes all three. And so ask the question, what is wrong? You know, 
I've seen people praying for the sick and just sort of waving their hands at them and not actually asking them what they want. You know, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And it's good to do that. But that doesn't mean a full medical analysis. <laughs> to those untrained in medicine, this can be confusing and hinder rather than aid faith. <laughs> I remember one dear brother I used to go to pray with regularly because a dear brother in our church in the days when, I mean, I'm, I'm not now doing much of this in the local church because I'm traveling, but I'm just based in that church. But I remember this dear brother, and I'd go and ask him how he was, and it would be half an hour of every detailed thing that the consultant had said as to why it was impossible for him to get better, you know, which didn't exactly help my faith to rise. But as the person is speaking, listen on two levels. Listen to them, give them your full attention. Can I just say, many Christian leaders are not brilliant at listening to people. We've always got advice to come up with. No, listen to what they're saying. But also, listening at the supernatural and being open to God receive words of knowledge and so on but give the person your full intention because that's an expression of your love to them examine why the person may have such a condition I remember one situation and again please this is unusual a bad back was traced to a physical accident of falling off a horse but there were huge emotional and demonic issues as well and it was, the situation was so bad, we took the person into our home for a while, and the consultant from the hospital, who wasn't a believer, visited and said to us, I think you can do more for her than I can. Because he picked up as well that there were all sorts of emotional issues surrounding this, and she did get healed eventually. It was a long time, but she did get there. You understand? And the doctor who came, I was there when he came. And that's what he said. So, and so there are different types of prayer appropriate to different situations. We may have a surge of faith or one-off healing prayer. We may be saying, let's keep going at this. Encourage the person to pray for their own healing as well. Sometimes praying for the emotional circumstances surrounding the problem, if this is relevant. Bring a prophetic dimension into it, particularly in small ministry team situations. Continue to ask questions. How are you doing? Sometimes people are scared to do that in case they say, oh, it's worse. <laughs> <laughs> you can say, oh, well, at least something's happening. Okay, so... <laughs> Is it feeling any better? Is there anything going on? It doesn't diminish the faith. I've known prayer pain gets worse before it gets better. And also we need to give advice on what people should do. See, that lady that I prayed for last week, who, you know, as I say, when I left Russia a week later, was still, you know, so it was, and she'd et, eaten everything she shouldn't and no problem with the stomach. But I said, look, because I believe this had an emotional root, be very, very careful not to go under rejection. I said, because people will still reject you. People will still say things that are not very good to you. But you refuse to go under that, refuse to say, oh, that means I'm no good. That means, you know, Please, I said, don't go under that. So I gave advice to her in terms of her ongoing healing. Okay. And carry on praying if the person wants it afterwards. Persist because persistence is important. Years and years ago, Francis McNutt talked about the Catholic uh, healing ministry, 
talked about soaking prayer, regular prayer times, continuing to seek God's for words which will help the situation, praying into the surrounding circumstances, and continuing to show love. So you keep going. And there's different ways in which God, heal, God heals or answers prayer, sometimes instantaneously. Wow, that's what happened when I was praying last week. Instantaneously, it stopped. Sometimes through a process. Sometimes spontaneously. I remember one guy in our church who was very deaf. And he was in the worship. And suddenly, as he put it to me afterwards, the band suddenly increased in volume. So it was almost deafening. He had the same problem as most of the church had, but he hadn't had it until that time. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's a joke. Uh, (laughs) I love it. Uh, He said, I couldn't understand it. Then he realized no one had prayed for him. No one... I'd spoken a word of knowledge, but his deafness had gone. He wasn't totally deaf in the sense of needing signing or anything like that, just hard of hearing, and it went. I don't know, yeah. You say, why, well, why? Why is somebody else not? Well, I don't know. But the Holy Spirit moves amongst us and does different things. So sometimes it's, it's spontaneously and sometimes you get word that way sometimes you get words of knowledge which like the one i referred to at the beginning about the guy at the stony bible week who came to christ as a result it was um i actually had the word of knowledge that he was being healed but we didn't i think never i never got the person to stand up or come to the front or anything like that it just happened and then through medical means. You know, when it comes to healing, we're all on the same side. If people, as a result of our prayer, get healed through medical means, through an operation, through medicine they're given, hallelujah. You know, this is part of God's com- common grace into our society. Amen. And most of it's that way, isn't it? That's fine. It's just because God is God overall. What about those who are not healed? Firstly, never, 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 never blame them for lack of faith. Or say, again, this is around in the charismatic movement, isn't it? Oh, if you had faith. All sorts of it's just painful stuff that's taught. Uh, again, it's all linked in with the prosperity gospel and the, um, that sort of teaching. I don't like to be too critical, but I've just seen the damage it causes worldwide. I work a lot in... No, I can't really go into this publicly. Okay, so... Um, the things that are said about lack of faith, okay? Don't heap condemnation upon people because then they're already sick and then they're condemned as well. Please. Possible reasons for healing not taking place? Sometimes, as James puts it, personal unconfessed sin creates a blockage. Having said that, some people get healed and never come to faith even. And that happened, what happened with Jesus, nine lepers didn't even come back. And again, because I believe in praying, sometimes we've seen more fruit in praying for people in the world than people in the church. Well, that's fine, because that's the breakout of the kingdom, one of them breakouts of the kingdom into society. Many, many others working for justice and all these things. But that's one. And 
I've, I've known, I can think of people in my hometown who we've prayed for, have been healed, have never come to Christ. So, again, hold all this in balance. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 30 suggests, on this account, some of you have, some have fallen sick and some have even died, the persistent and widespread disunity, sin and unbelief in companies of Christians can inhibit healing for individual members. Sometimes there's a general negative attitude to life. It's hard to pray for hypochondriacs to be healed. <laughs> this lady that came to me that I said had been, who was counting scalps of the big ministries that had <laughs> prayed for her and then came back to down to little old me, had, you know, they'd... She was like that. Ever so negative about everything. Sometimes the person doesn't really want to be healed. It's easier to stay as they are. Even Jesus asked on one occasion, John 5, do you want to get well? I recall one incident where we were praying for healing at the end of a very powerful meeting. And a particular person was encouraged to go forward because other people were being healed. And he said, if I'm healed, I'll have to get a job. <laughs> Actually said that. <laughs> but there's an element of mystery about physical healing. It has never been the experience of the church that all are healed even in New Testament times. In John 5, even Jesus only healed one out of a large number of people. People have long-standing illnesses in the New Testament, even Christian leaders. Trophimus, I left in Miletus sick. Come on, Paul. Don't you, haven't you got faith? No. Trophimus, I left sick. One person, who was it? Epaphroditus, was it? Yeah. said, God spared him so that I didn't get even more trouble. But did, didn't you just pray for him in faith, Paul? Yeah, on other occasions, Paul did. Yeah? Now, Ephesus, extraordinary miracles. And that was almost certainly when Paul was at work. You know, he would, as far as we can tell, Ephesus in the morning, oh, time's gone. <laughs> in the morning, he would work making tents. Lunchtime, he taught in the hall of Tyrannus. Evening, he went from house to house. Amazing. And, you know, it was hot in Ephesus. He'd be making tents, very hot work. And... He would be, have sweatbands on, which he would, as they got wet as they do in the heat, toss them aside. And people would come and pick them up, lay them on the sick, and they'd be healed. I mean, that's extraordinary miracles, it says. But other times, he didn't see that. Come on, Paul. No, no understand there's a mystery about it the reason theologically is that though the kingdom of God has come its fullness has not yet come or better I prefer to say now I used to always say now and not yet I sometimes say it's come now and is coming coming in its fullness when Jesus returns but still coming as the kingdom grows you understand the kingdom is here, therefore we expect people to be healed. The kingdom of God is still coming in its fullness. But we have a responsibility to extend the kingdom here and now and grow in faith. Okay. I think that will do. <laughs> now, at this point... Do we, we don't have a break at all, do we now? We keep them going all afternoon. 
I didn't put this programme together, all right? <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> Pardon? They can rest at home, OK. Yeah, we finished at four, so you've got plenty of time to take it easy. <laughs> um, it's put down question and answer. Now, not just about physical healing, but anything you've heard today, <laughs> anything you've heard today in the opening sessions, are there any questions that people are bursting to ask? Or even would like to ask. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, you talked about uh, traumatic protection and uh, What about inanimate, inanimate objects? Yeah, sure. I didn't. I didn't use the word possession, actually. Okay, okay. okay. Sorry. I just need to say that because I'll be talking about that tomorrow. And yes, I'll be. Aunt, I believe there are places. I've prayed around houses. And I believe there, are, there can be objects that are affected by this, but people can get into all sorts of super spiritual bondages on that. So I'm reluctant on it. But I have prayed around homes where it seems things have been done before people moved in and seen peace come to those homes where there's previously disturbance. So, yes, but I'm reluctant to say too much because people get into all sorts of things. And again, years ago in the charismatic movement, there was all sorts of things like burning your records and all that sort of stuff. And I, I just feel people got into unhelpful stuff. And uh, therefore, I'm, yes, but I don't make too much of it. Is that? Yes. Not particularly. What I, no, what I would say, number one, tread carefully because mental illness is a sickness and is not usually connected with the demonic. Okay. Now, occasionally it is. I want, a few years ago, I did a conference with a Christian psychiatrist and we did it together to try and cover both these things um, and also I make it a practice that if somebody is being regularly treated by mental health professionals that I, I would counsel people I say I'm not involved in this but the people supporting them in the church I would counsel to support in prayer not try and complicate it by referring to deliverance issues. Uh, I, we'll come on to how you pray for people who are afflicted by demonic power. As I say, I would never use the word possessed. Um, I will come on to that tomorrow in more detail, okay, because that's part of what I've been asked to do tomorrow. But um, I, uh, I, I feel we're in dangerous ground if we push into mental health issues. Now, sometimes when we've been praying with people over certain emotional issues, mental health has thereafter improved, but I haven't gone in on that basis. Does that? Yeah. Yes, right at the back. Sorry, deal with what in the church? Which is in the church? I'm going to deal with how the um, how the enemy can work within church life, and I'm not going to deal with that particular thing. But I am going to deal with controlling in the church. I'm going to deal with things that are attacks in the church. I'm going to deal with things like what I call battle for the first fruits, um, and I'm going to deal with uh, Jezebelic issues, which I do believe are referred to in the New Testament as well. So all of that I will deal with tomorrow. Um, I, how about um, <coughs> false healing? 
Oh, come on, yeah. Sorry, very good point. Yeah, no, no, I, I should have said that, John. Thank you very much. I always say to people, we, I, I, don't, I don't have the authority to take you off medication. You do that to the doctor. So if the doctor's given you medication, and if you f feel better as a result of prayer for healing, then go to the doctor and tell him you're now better. Whether you want to tell him about how you were healed is up to you. But it's his responsibility or her responsibility to take you off medication. Um, and I have never thrown my glasses away in faith. <laughs> However, having said that, I used to be ultra short-sighted. Now I only need them for reading, but that's because I had cataract surgery. <laughs> it's amazing. I could suddenly drive without glasses, having had them since I was four. <laughs> but I need them now because I've got to read my notes. Okay. Yes. No, no, what I was talking about, and probably time uh, stopped me going into that too much, I was talking about the, the principalities and powers and so on. So we have authority to set people free from demonic oppression, but we don't have authority to engage directly these higher powers or, as some people do, start praying at Satan himself. Because the book of Jude, is it? It says, even the archangel Michael, when disputing with the devil over the body of Moses, didn't bring an accusation against him, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. And when it comes to this sort of thing, I often will use that expression. You know, May the Lord rebuke the powers that are at work in this situation. But I can help people get free of the spirit of the strongholds that may be in their particular culture. Okay? And can set people free if there's demonic power affecting their lives. Does that... Yeah, I've clarified what I was saying. Yes. Sorry, I didn't hear the first bit. Okay. It's strange with some of these spiritual gifts. It says gifts of healings, plural, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in a sense... <laughs> Sorry. So it's gifts of healings. So it's not that you have a gift of healing, but rather God uses you from time to time to give gift of healing to the person who's sick and needs healing. Do you, do you see what I mean? So it's not, do I know whether I have a gift of healing? I, I don't use that language. Rather, that within the body, people get healed uh, as a gift from God, but that is usually coming through people praying for them and laying hands on them. Does that help? So I don't think, have I got, I don't even think, have I got a gift of healing? I don't think that way. I just know that part of my uh, ministry is to pray for the sick and I've seen growing faith in relation to that.
Yes. Talking about culture. Yeah. It's, it's a very good question. It's, and bear with me on this. It's reading the Bible, unless you were a, a, a well, no, even then it's over many, many years. I was going to say, unless you were a first century Jew, it's always a cross cultural experience. Okay, so when I'm reading the Bible, I'm reading, this not make it, doesn't make it difficult, it just makes us humble. I'm reading what was said there in a particular cultural situation. Okay? I then bring my own cultural spectacles to look at it. And so I've got to try and say, okay, two things. Firstly, what would that have meant at the time to people then? But secondly, how do I apply that to me in my culture now? But thirdly, I also understand that God can speak out of scriptures to people dynamically in a way that encourages them, even though, I've got to be careful here, even though it's not primarily what it meant, but God can speak to people through it. But it, you can't divorce either your reading or what was written from the cultural context of you now or the scriptures then. Okay, so let me give you some examples. So for example, Jesus told a story about a man who went to his friend at midnight. And now in a Western context, we emphasize the fact that he must have gone on knocking because no one's going to come down in the middle of the night in a Western context and give someone some bread. <laughs> I can go to the 24-hour supermarket. Okay? <laughs> so he must have been very persistent. But in an Eastern context, never would someone go to a village and not be fed. And I've experienced this even if you're not hungry. <laughs> And so, the Eastern context would say, of course, someone coming to a village must be fed, and because they think corporate, not individual, of course, the village is responsible to feed the person. Okay, so how can you think of a God who would just let you knock, 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 now, there are other scriptures that teach persistence, but here, because Jesus goes on to say, so ask and you will receive, seek and you will find. And so an Eastern cultural understanding of that would help us understand the word of God. But it's not wrong to say, but if I'm, I need to persist in prayer. Do you, do you see what I'm, I'm, I'm saying there? So we have to handle this carefully, but we have to still understand the cultural context of the scripture. Someone was asking me in a break as well, do I believe there's such a thing as Christian culture? No. I believe this Christian truth, Christian principles, Christian values expressed through the different cultures. Okay. Um, and so we... And there's other scriptures, like 1 Corinthians 11 about head coverings. I know that, yeah. When I'm teaching in Pakistan, I teach that. Because when I'm teaching in Pakistan, it is honoring to the culture for women to have their head covered, just as when my wife and I go to Tajikistan, 
My first thing my wife does is go to a Tajik dressmaker and get Tajik clothes to honour the culture. If I taught that in the West, it would just be religious nonsense. You know, because it's got nothing to do with how we are respected. You, you understand? So, this is not easy. And I'm not trying to make it more complicated. But the truth of Christianity, and that's the beauty of it, can, is expressed through the different cultures of the world. Whereas Islam, one of, the, one, of the people, one of the virtues they would claim is that it's done the same everywhere in the world. Do you, do you follow me? Sorry, that's a long answer, and I'm not sure I even answered what you were really asking. But it is, it is a, a thing to really think through. Yes, Gareth. Yeah, in my name, yeah. Yeah, and the, I suppose I should have been repeating these questions, or will they not go on the, you'll do something good. Okay, <laughs> the, in the name of Jesus means we're doing it for his glory and through his authority and we're using his name. I'll teach when I come on to deliverance prayer tomorrow that I don't just say in Jesus' name to demons, in Jesus' name go, leave in Jesus' name, blah, blah, blah. I bring all the truth about Jesus when I'm praying. I say, I'm anticipating I'm going to say, I talk about the empty tomb. I talk about his exaltation to the right hand of God. So I'll be very careful not to use it simply as a formula, but to use it as being to his honour and his glory. Does that? Yeah, one more and then we'll have to move on. Sure, very good point. This is the atmosphere that your church... Our churches need to be, have accepting atmospheres where it's as much an evidence of the kingdom of God that the terminal ill or those with long-term illnesses are cared for and supported and honoured as well as rejoicing when people are praying for healing. It's a very good point. It was in my notes and I didn't get to it. But it's very, very important. So people with long-term sickness don't feel that somehow they're second-class citizens because somebody else has got healed and that sort of thing. But you do that by honouring them, caring for them, as a body of Christ should do.